everybody. Welcome. My name is Leslie Hertig. I'm the Artistic Director at the Vancouver Writers Fest, and we're so glad that you've joined us here this morning. Margaret Oleman Pokiak Fenton and Christy Jordan Fenton will be joining us to talk about Fatty Legs on Courage and Bravery, which is celebrating its 10th anniversary with reflections on the book's significant impact, as well as new stories. First, however, I'd like to share a message with you from Rebecca Duncan of the Squamish Nation. Osiam Tanoya, Titehema Queen Kwashamin, Rebecca Queen Sna, Scotmish Chin, Etina Chantla, Homatsquam, O Home Eman, Yoan Hartlin Squaw, and Quistlak no more yap eight tea, Natti come come alike. O Homer, Scotmish Oath, Homatsquam Oath, a Tselewatos, Hi to Merchit. Hello, everybody. My true name is Titai Hemat. I am from the Squamish Nation, and it is my honor to welcome you to our beautiful territory we call Kam Kamalai, known as Vancouver, where all the maple trees are. It is shared territory between the Squamish, the Musqueam, and the Tsleil-Waututh people very sacred land for us. And we are part of the Coast Salish family, which means we are people of the cedar. As you could see, my beautiful yellow cedar cape. We utilize cedar for our canoes, our baskets, our tools, our clothing, many, many things. We are also people of the salmon, people of the longhouse. The longhouse for us is our church, our hospital, and our school. We go there to learn, to heal and to pray. We are also people of the canoes. So welcome to our territory. We are excited to have you here. And by acknowledging you and acknowledging our ancestors, our ancestors will take care of you and welcome you to our land. Osiam. Thank you so much, Rebecca. The Vancouver Writers' Fest carries out its work on the unceded and ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples, and we are very grateful to be here. We would also like to thank our government sponsors today, CMHC Granville Island, the Department of Canadian Heritage, the Canada Council for the Arts, the Government of BC, the BC Arts Council, and the City of Vancouver. We could not put this festival on without your support. And now on to the reason that we're here. Margaret Oleman Pokiak Fenton is the courageous and resilient survivor of residential school. And she shared her story in the form of four award-winning books and speaking engagements across Canada. I'm told she is also a remarkable embroiderer and she does great beadwork and bannock as well. Christy Jordan Fenton has many fascinating careers under her belt and Christy, I hope you'll share some of those with us a little later. But today she's joining us as a public speaker and a writer, and she's helping to share this important story about resilience and courage. Please welcome Margaret and Christy. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Uh, hello, Jahana Che. We're coming to you today from the territory of the Danaiza, which on a map would be known as Fort St. John, British Columbia. So I'm Christy, and joining me today is my children's grandmother and my best friend, Margaret Ulimon. So we use both names for her. Margaret um, is her conventional name and Ulimon her traditional name. I don't know if you want to say hi, Margaret. <laughs> oh, hi. <laughs> So we're going to be talking to you today about Fatty Legs, which is, um, turns 10 this year. And that's a story um, that we worked on together. We have four other books we worked on together. And because Fatty Legs is this really funny sounding title, people always ask us how we ended up working on the book together. So this is how it happened. So Margaret is the grandmother of my children. And as I said, we live in the territory of the Danaiza. But Margaret is an Inavaluk from the territory of the Inavaluit. So quite a bit further north than where we're at now. And I'll show you in a moment on a map where that is. So um, being out of territory, I really wanted my children to know what it meant to be Inavaluit. 
And the only way I could do that was to go to their grandmother and get stories from her about um, uh, living up north and hunting wolves and polar bears and traveling by dog sled. She has lots of great stories. And maybe some of you are, um, have parents or grandparents from somewhere else. So um, maybe you have parents or grandparents who are from China and how you would understand how to be Chinese is you would go to your parents or your grandparents for stories. So that's what I did. So we were driving to town one day and Margaret told me a really different story. She said, they used to call me fatty legs. And she went on to tell me when she was just eight years old that she wanted nothing more in the world than to learn how to read. But in order to do that, she had to travel really far away to go to a residential school. And that's a school where you have to live at. So when she got there, she got stuck there for two years, which has to be the longest school day ever. And when she was there, this mean nun picked on her all the time and she made her wear these bright red stockings. So all the other kids teased her and called her fatty legs. So then Margaret told me this very brave story that I also thought was kind of funny about how she got rid of her stockings. And it was a great story. So I said, Margaret, please let me write a book about this story. This is awesome. And what did you say, Margaret? I said, no, I don't want you to write about me. And why didn't you want me to write about you? I didn't want my grandchildren to know I was naughty at one time. So she thinks what she did was really naughty. What she did with those stockings actually was a secret she kept for 65 years. That's a very long time to keep a secret. So she wasn't ready to just let the cat out of the bag and let me tell. But I kept at her until she finally agreed. And it's funny that we're at the 10th anniversary now because Margaret says she only agreed to let me write down her story because she thought nobody would want to read it. Nobody would publish it. I would just write it and it would get forgotten. And now we're at 10 years. So if you bear with me a moment, I'm going to pull out some um, slides and pictures and things that I brought today. And we'll just be one moment to get onto the um, slideshow from the beginning. And uh, there's, uh, there's the schooner is called North oh, Star. We're not oh. at that one yet, Margaret. I'm just, if you just hang on one moment, I'm trying to uh, get okay. where we want to, where we want to be. Technology. Oh my goodness. Okay. Um, so I'm trying to get it from, let's try from the curve. Uh, this might be about as good as we're going to get. It doesn't seem to want to pop up as a slideshow right now. Just hang on two seconds. Oh, I see what's going on. Okay. Let's just back right up. It's already open as a slideshow. Okay. So here we have um, Margaret as a little girl. So this is a couple of years sort of before she went to school. And you can see her as a character or an illustration in a book. Then she's about 16 and um, here's a photo that's more recent of Margaret. So this is a true story that we're gonna be talking about today. And um, here's a, a shows Margaret throughout the years. So if you can try and find yourselves on this map, maybe your teachers can help you. And then once you've found where you're at on the map, I want you to travel all the way over to where the house is. So that's the icon that's the lowest down. That's where we're coming to you at from today. So that's the territory of the Danaiza, also known as Fort St. John. That's about 16 to 18 hours from Vancouver and about seven hours from Edmonton. So from there, you would have to travel about three and a half days going north to end up in Inuvik, which would be a little bit over from where those books are. Then you'd get on a plane for two and a half hours to end up where the mittens are, and that's where Margaret's from. So if she lived any further north, I think that would be living with Santa Claus. I like to tease her about that. So to go to school, she had to travel across the ocean and then come up the river to where you see those books, and that's where she went to school. It doesn't look like a very big distance on a map, but it's a really, really long distance. She was very far from home. So here's what it looks like where Margaret's from. This is Banks Island. That's where she grew up. And you'll notice there's no trees there. So it's so far north, the trees don't grow. And in front is the ocean, and that would freeze for 10 months of the year. Those little buildings there are actually framed tents. So Margaret's people were semi-nomadic. What that means is every once in a while, they'd pack up all their things, and they'd move somewhere else for better hunting or fishing, trapping, trading. So they lived in tents and they'd put snow and ice around them to keep them really nice and warm and insulated. And they'd have a stove inside and that's how her people lived. 
And here you'll see Margaret, who's that largest child in the middle there? Uh, That's uh, you, Margaret. <laughs> okay. She can't see the picture. Oh, oh. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's just a small little picture and I had to. Oh, okay. Yeah, Most Margaret's <laughs> Margaret's joining us today from her iPad. So um the child in the middle is Margaret. She's around 10 or 11 there. That's just after she came home from residential school. But you can see she has on a parka there and underneath is a heavy uh, layer of caribou fur. And if you don't know what a caribou is, it's really kind of a wild reindeer. So if that fur is gonna keep an animal really warm up north, it's probably gonna keep you warm. So the time Margaret was born, she had thousands and thousands and thousands of years of ancestral knowledge to know how to live really well where she was at. So um, what that means is that she had the, her grandparents, great grandparents, great great grandparents, great 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 grandparents going way back thousands and thousands of years um, that would um, have gotten better and better and better at living where um, they were at. So by the time they got there, uh, Margaret was born, they had a really great idea of how to live quite well in the North. And if you just hang on a second, I'm gonna try and adjust my, um, let's see. I think there's some trouble seeing my video screen and I don't know if that fixed it. Uh, I'm wondering if, everybody can see okay now I don't know I'll we'll just have to wait and see in the chat so let's find out um Hi, and the we're slides are not changing okay we're still on the same first slide okay so what I'm gonna do oh we're missing out on everything okay so I'm gonna stop a share and start a share again and we'll recap let's see now can you see now yes, yes. okay do you see yourself Margaret yeah, I can see myself now. <laughs> okay, technical really? difficulties. So now I can't seem to change slides. Let's just see. Oh, there we go. Okay, so I'm going to back up a moment. This is where Margaret lives. If you didn't get to see that picture, let's go back to the map. Okay, so if you see the house, that's where we live. And then uh, if you travel way up to the mittens, that's where Margaret's from, very far up north. And then if you travel over to where the stack of books are, that's where Margaret went to school. And here's the island where she lived. So you can see the um, tents there, that there's no trees and that the ocean um, would be frozen there for 10 months of the year. Okay, so now here we all get to see Margaret when she's 10 and she's got on her nice warm parka. So um, her, she had all that ancestral knowledge, her grandparents, great grandparents, great, 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 great grandparents, they all came up with a better and a better way to live where she was at. So the time she was born, they knew exactly how to live there. But when she went to school, they dressed them like this. Now, no matter where you're living at, I think this probably isn't a smart thing to wear in the middle of winter at your school. Now, the outsiders came and they were very new to the area and they still thought they knew way better how to live in that area than the people who had lived there for thousands and thousands of years. So I'm pretty sure we can all agree that people who just showed up in the territory maybe didn't know as much as people who had been there forever. This is what I'm choosing for the winter to wear. So at Margaret's school, she had one teacher um, that in Fatty Lakes is called the Swan. Her name was Sister McQuillan and she was um, nice to Margaret. So she was a teacher who wanted to be there and really liked the kids. Most of Margaret's teachers were not like this. Most of Margaret's teachers were, were really cruel actually. But the swan was a real person. So if you look in the middle of this photograph, you'll see um, a taller woman and that's Sister McQuillan, a real person. Um, behind the school, you can see that there are some trees. It's very hard to see, but there are some trees there. Now, where Margaret went to school was just far enough south that trees start to grow, but they, they're not very big trees. They're pretty scruffy, almost like Charlie Brown Christmas trees. Margaret was terrified of the trees because she, she didn't grow up with trees. So they used to take the children berry picking, which was the really fun activity to do because you could go and you never had enough to eat. So you'd try and shove um, all the berries in you could and sneak some and um, fill your belly up. But they made it really awful for the um, children, they would tell them stories of monsters waiting to get them and children who disappeared in the woods, not true stuff. They just wanted to scare them. But Margaret actually has a funny story about Sister McQuillan and about trees, and I'm gonna get her to tell that. 
Hello, hello. You, I'm supposed to be on. Oh, you are on. Yeah, you are on, Margaret. Can you oh, tell okay. them about Sister McQuillan and about the trees? Oh, uh, Sister McQuillan, she was a very nice person. And she uh, loved telling stories. One day she asked me if I knew where the apples came from. I said, I have no idea. And she said, well, they grow on trees. And I looked at her and I thought she was lying, but I couldn't imagine an apple growing on a tree. And well, I said, I didn't know that. Well, she said when she was a young girl, she lived in Prince Edward Island and when the apples were ready, she'd just go out in the yard and pick one and eat it. So that might seem kind of silly to you that Margaret didn't know apples grow on trees. But Margaret's story takes place at the same time as World War II. Now, she wasn't where the war was happening, but her story takes place at that time. And she didn't have access to um, computers. She didn't have computers. She didn't get to watch YouTube videos. She didn't get to Google anything. She didn't have a TV. And they got very few books and magazines. So she knew a lot about where she lived. She knew where to find um goose eggs and how to tell when the geese were going to be able to return. She knew um, how to bring the sled dogs to her father after he had maybe shot a caribou. She knew all kinds of things, but she didn't know about the outside world. So for her to imagine apples growing on a tree just seemed like so out of this world. And if you ever see the trees up north, these scruffy Charlie Brown Christmas trees, you just couldn't imagine an apple growing on them. Now, when Margaret was at school, there was a pandemic, kind of like we're experiencing now. And this um, uh, building you're seeing behind Sister McQuillan is actually a hospital. The school was next door to it and where Margaret went to school. And they made the little girls work at the hospital. So when the pandemic happened, instead of everybody going home and trying to stay safe and away from each other, they put the little girls in the hospital to go to work and exposing them to all these sick people. So we're talking about Margaret's story today, which I said takes place at the same time as World War II. But residential schools, so they started in the time of our great, 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 great grandparents, but they didn't end until a year after I graduated high school. So what was going on the year that uh, residential schools finally ended, everybody was gaming on a Nintendo, listening to the Spice Girls. They were watching um, The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, and that's when the first Toy Story movie came out. So it's not as long ago as we think. Um, as I said, a year after I graduated high school. And for those of you who are students tuning in today, I'm probably about the same age as your parents, maybe a little bit older, but around that age, and probably about the same age as most of your teachers or most of the adults tuning in today. So really not that long ago. So when Margaret was going to go to school, she got to go back to school shopping. So they loaded up the schooner, which we'll show you in a little bit, which is a type of boat. And they traveled to Eklavik, where she was going to go to school, the town of Eklavik, or village. And she got to go shopping at the Hudson's Bay Company. So they took in the furs, and they traded in their furs, and then they got store credit to go shopping. And I'm going to let Margaret tell you about when she went back to school shopping. The day before mom took me to the school, she said, oh, we got to go do some shopping. So we went to the Hudson Bay and we started shopping. Uh, we didn't understand English, can't read, but we buy things by what they look like. Anyway, uh, she said, oh, we got to buy a toothbrush and toothpaste. So we did that and she dropped me off at the school. And the next morning I had to follow whatever other girls were doing. And then they started brushing their teeth. And I thought to myself, I got one of those, so I got my toothbrush and the toothpaste out, and when I put it in my mouth, it was horrible. It was shaving cream instead of toothpaste. So if you can imagine brushing your teeth with um, shaving cream and how gross that would be, oh my goodness. So we can have a good laugh at that, but also why should Margaret's mother have been able to... Um, read or, or understand English. She was an Inavalic woman who spoke Inavaluktan and lived in the territory of the Inavaluit. So she spoke the same language that had been spoken there for thousands of years. Maybe some of you have experienced coming to Canada and not speaking English well, maybe a first day of class not speaking English well, 
or you've been to another country where you didn't understand the language well, and you just have to kind of follow along what everybody else is doing and guess a lot. Well, that's the position Margaret was in, but Margaret and her mother didn't go to another country. Another country um, came to them. So um, I just want to check in that uh, everybody's still being able to see the slides a lot. I know we have a special friend on Lorene today. Um, Lorene, if you can't see my slides, just send me a message so that I know so that we can get that fixed. Um, so at the school, Margaret had a teacher who was a real bully and we just called her the raven in the book. Uh, Margaret does know her name, but we didn't want to make the story about her, so we didn't use her name. So the story is about Margaret and how Margaret made it through the school, not about how mean this woman was. But unfortunately, most of us, somewhere in our lives are going to know a bully. Usually they're about our age, maybe a little older. At Margaret's school, her biggest bullies were the adults. Now, because her story takes place at the same time as World War II, she couldn't pick up a phone, no text messages, no uh, email, no Zoom. She couldn't uh, Snapchat, she couldn't make a TikTok video. She had none of those things to tell her parents what was going on. Even if she could have, they couldn't come and get her. Once the ocean froze, they couldn't bring their boat to come and get her. She couldn't go to the police because the RCMP actually gathered up a lot of children and made them go to the school. And she couldn't even go to the other teachers because even though not all the teachers were this mean, a lot of them just accepted, well, this is the way the schools are, this is how it is. And on top of that, some of the teachers themselves were getting bullied pretty badly by other teachers. So all she could do was stay really, really strong in her spirit and in her heart and be very, very clever in her mind. When you're hearing stories about children who went to residential school, always look for not just how much they suffered or how bad it was at the school, but look for the ways that the children were being heroes to themselves. So, um, Children raised in an Indigenous way, they would have, and still today, will have a spirit name or a traditional name given that will say what's most strong about that person's spirit or what their biggest gift is. And I'm going to see, so right here, beside the illustration of Margaret, you're going to see a type of knife that the Inuit women use. That's called an ulu. And beneath that is a big black stone that's called an ulimon. That's the same as Margaret's name. And what that name means, um, that stone is what you sharpen that knife with. So it means Margaret's strong, she's determined, she cannot be worn down. She had that name. She wasn't allowed to use it at the school. She could only use Margaret, but she knew I'm Ulimon, I'm strong, I'm determined, I can't be worn down. So that's something that the Indigenous children would take with them to school, is knowing what was strong about them. And also because they had so many jobs to do from a young age, they were really clever and smart. And what I loved about Margaret's story and her stockings is it showed her being really strong. She couldn't be worn down and being really, really clever and smart to get rid of those stockings so no one could ever find them. Um, so next to this picture is another instance where Margaret was really strong and brave and very courageous. Margaret, do you wanna tell them about when you went to the radio station? Uh, they uh, they got us, to, us into a group and said we will go to the radio station and uh, send greetings to our parents and then we all walked over to where the radio station was and uh, people took the kids took turns saying hi to their parents but they also gave you a little note saying that you have to read this and don't say your own words and uh, when it was my turn, I wouldn't say anything. I decided I'm not going to read that. And if I can't say what I want, I'm not saying not a, not a word. And uh, my mother said she was waiting for me to say something. And all she could hear was me breathing into the microphone. And they took me away because I wouldn't talk. So Margaret was left with this place where she couldn't really make a choice they'd taken that away from her so back in the day how they would communicate up north is they would go to the local radio station and they just send a message out over the airwaves she wasn't allowed to say what she wanted to what she really wanted to say is help the school's horrible come and get me but she was told what she had to say or she'd be punished so she chose not to say anything which i thought was really clever and, and very courageous though um, i'm sure it absolutely broke her mother's heart but that's how she managed around that 
So when Margaret went to school, she was expecting it to be a really exciting place. Indigenous children in most communities who are raised traditionally didn't know what it was for an adult to just be mean or pick on a child ever. And Margaret was raised in a really loving way. So she couldn't have imagined. She had seen the nuns around town and she thought they were going to be so nice and she was going to learn to read right away and then go home. She didn't realize that she'd be there for so long. So when she showed up at school, it was like her big dream. She had all these ideas of how wonderful it was going to be. This is a thing she spent months and months and months bugging her father to go and do, to go to the school. And it turned out really different. And Margaret, did you want to um, read maybe and share share with our, uh, with the viewers about what happened when you went to your first day of school? I'm from Fatty Legs. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> oh, there we go. Mm -hmm. I, I followed the big nun upstairs that creaked under my feet to a large room filled with beds. Across the room were seven girls who had been among the sullen children I had seen earlier. They were standing in a somber line in front of four foul-smelling wooden stalls along one wall. The outsider pushed me into place at the end of the row, and I nearly gagged from the odor that wafted from the stall behind us. Another dark cloak man passed by the girls, eyeing them up and down one by one. She clutched a large pair of shears. She stopped in front of a small, sickly-looking Inuit girl. I knew the girl must be of the copper Inuit from Victoria Island, because her park was drawn high at the sides, the front and back hanging low like a beaver's tail, unlike the Mother Hubbard parkas we wore in the West. The girl shrank under the nun's glare, catching a firm hold on one of the girl's long braids. The nun snipped it off with a clean slice and let it fall to the floor. The girl hid her face in her hands as the second braid was cut. Then none did the same to four other girls, sparing only one older girl and one of the outsider's children, who was likely a trapper's daughter. The sound of sheer thick, severing thick black hair drowned out the howls of the disgraced girls. At last, only I remained. I held my breath. I was large for my age. Surely she would pass over me. She did not. She stopped directly in front of me. I stepped back from the heavy cross, which nearly struck me in the face, but she reached out and yanked me back by one braid. I can fix my own hair, I protested in, in a welcome, but she held tight and this, with the same motion a bird makes to pull a piece of flesh from a fish, clamped the jaws of the shears down on my braid and severed it. I was horrified. I wasn't a baby. My other braid fell to the floor to meet the first, and I joined the others in their weeping. There we stood sobbing in the humiliation of our discarded hair. Well, just a really unimaginably terrible first day of school. If you've ever wanted something so bad, maybe it was um, you asked for something for Christmas or you wanted to go visit someplace special, and it turns out not to be that great or it breaks right away. You know, that kind of disappointment. Now imagine being far away from your family, from your home. You've just had your hair cut off. They would take away the traditional clothing as well. So Margaret didn't just show up in stuff that was bought at Walmart. This was stuff that people in her family and her community spent a long time making for her. So it was just this really awful feeling. Now, there were a lot of reasons why they cut the hair. And for the students tuning in today, um, maybe your teachers can go over some of those reasons um, with you, or you guys can um, send me a, a message on Facebook Messenger. Uh, my name is exactly the same as on the book cover. Um, or get in touch with us another way, and we can um, talk about all those different reasons why they cut the hair. I'm just going to go over some really quick um, sort of things today. So one of the things they were doing is they were taking away all the children's individuality. So you see in this book cover that was painted by Liz Amini Holmes, who's the illustrator of Fatty Legs, 
you can see that they all look like clones. And she said when she painted this book cover that um, she didn't paint the tops of their heads. So this isn't cropped to fit the book cover. Their, their heads were never painted. She said because she wanted to show who these girls were, what their hopes, what their dreams were. At the school, it didn't matter. Residential schools were really established to create a workforce out of Indigenous children. They wanted to create, um, they wanted them to grow up and to do jobs nobody else wanted to do in Canada. So uh, the original schools were actually called industrial schools. So industrial for industry, which means work. They were, they were training people to do jobs people didn't want to do. In Margaret's case, they were training them to work in the hospital, not to be um, nurses and doctors, but to empty out bathroom waste and change sheets and deliver meals and things like that. The jobs nobody else wanted to do. Though Margaret has a sister who became the first Inavalik registered nurse. So she took that opportunity. She just kept going all the way with it. Um, so we're going to um, switch gears a little bit now. And Margaret has all these beautiful photographs. Her father loved to take pictures. He loved to have his picture taken. And we're really blessed to have a lot of those photos um, today. So I'm going to get Margaret to tell you about this special photo. Uh, there's a, a schooner. It's quite large and it's, it's called North Star. And we travel with it because my dad was a mechanic and he'd look after the engine and we'd go shopping once a year after the ice goes away and uh, we'd go back to the island in September. So they go on one shopping trip once a year everything they needed for the whole year they had to get in that one trip and if they didn't they had to go without or they had to find it off the land now maybe some of you have parents who have tried to do this at costco but you'll know it's impossible to get everything for the whole year so um her mother and father must have been very good at writing shopping lists much better than me margaret how many families would travel on this boat sometimes there's seven families and um, how many children, how many siblings did you have? Uh, 14 brothers and sisters, but they didn't come all at once. So Margaret had 14 brothers and sisters, but they didn't all travel on this boat. Some of them came after they were done traveling on this boat. A really special thing for any of you tuning in from Vancouver or the Vancouver area, the Vancouver Maritime Museum, which is awesome because it shows all sorts of things from up north from when Margaret was growing up. But if you go behind the Vancouver Maritime Museum they and down the slope to the ocean, they have a dock there where they have historical boats docked there that still get sailed. And this boat, the North Star, is one of those boats docked there. So the man who owns it is a wonderful man named Bruce McDonald, and he's a historian of this boat. And we've talked to lots of students who've had a chance to actually go and see the boat Margaret grew up on. And there's a barge load of firewood. When the ice goes away from the Mackenzie River, we go into the bush and uh, load a large barge. And then when we come back, we don't go to school for two whole weeks. We just spend that time unloading the barge load of wood. So that's actually Margaret in the middle there. That's just before she went home from the school. What they would do is they'd show up at the school with, when the barge loads of wood started coming in, or sometimes they'd take the children out to gather the wood, and they'd say, two weeks, no school, which probably sounds pretty good. They'd say, we're just going to go outside and unload firewood. So if you're like me and you don't like sitting still in a desk all day, it sounds good. But that wood went several rows back and wrapped way around. They lived at the school, so they could get them up at six in the morning, and they'd make them work till 10 or 11 o'clock at night. So Margaret says they would make them work until they just couldn't even lift their arms anymore. So if you look at the one building that isn't covered with the firewood, that's where Margaret went to school. There's two wings, so there's two different sides to it. One was a boy's side and one was a girl's side. And when Margaret's brother went to the school later on, she only got to see him at times for a few minutes, like um, at times like Christmas. So it's really hard to feel like a family when you don't get to spend time with your family and make memories with them. I'm sure some of you have a brother or sister you'd be pretty happy not to see again, 
But if you were away from all your family and your friends and um, your home, that person will become really important to you. And there's my two little sisters. And when I was going to school, I didn't get toys like that. <clears throat> But the hardwood floors are still the same. And we spend a lot of time scrub scrubbing the floors on our hands and knees. But the nice part was uh, after you put all the wax on the floor, they'd give us woolen socks and we'd skid across the rooms to polish the floors. So if you can imagine, um, those of you who are in a class or um, if you're at home joining us today, if you could think of going to a school gymnasium, putting down lots of wax and then getting wool stockings and slipping and sliding up and down like human bumper cars, how really fun that would be. That was the big exciting thing when Margaret was young. And as she said, this is a picture of her sisters. They didn't have toys like that when she went to the school. Except it was the days before Swiffer wet jet. So they were on their hands and knees and scrubbing. And all that scrubbing they did was really how they kept the kids busy. So they didn't have parents at the school. Where Margaret's from in the Arctic in the winter time, the sun doesn't really come out. So it's really cold and dark outside. You can't really just send kids outside a whole lot. Um, they didn't do very many hours of schoolwork at all. They only did a few hours of schoolwork a day. So how do you think they kept them busy? This is it on their hands and knees and scrubbing. But this isn't the worst chore Margaret had to do. Margaret, do you want to tell them the worst chore you had to do? There was one morning uh, the nun said, today uh, we'll need two volunteers. One, uh, the first one, they said, if you go into, to, they call it mass because if you go into the church you don't have to do the other and so I thought I wonder what that is and then I thought well I'm going to try the second one and it was emptying honey buckets because we didn't have running water terrible smelly job <laughs> so if you don't know what a honey bucket is there's nothing sweet about it and it's not filled with honey where Margaret went to school they would have to go um, to outhouses. So that means their bathrooms were outside. But because it was dark and cold a lot of the time, when they couldn't go outside to go to the bathroom, they had buckets that everybody went to the bathroom in. So if you wouldn't go to church in the morning, then they would make you go and empty the buckets with all your classmates' bathroom waste in it. You'd have to go down to the river and, and dump that out. And that was a chore Margaret had to do a lot. And there's a picture of the boys that went to the residential school. And in March, they had uh, muskrat trapping season. So they pick out the older boys and they'd all go send them to the bush and trap muskrats. And after all the, the that ends, they come back and uh, they come back with beautiful furs. They also brought back the muskrat carcasses and they fed them to us. So if you can imagine eating muskrat. Now I will point out, this is a traditional food for some people. So some Anishinaabeg people, some Northern Cree, some Dene peoples. Um, there's a type of Inavaluit that, that live in the Delta that eat muskrat, but not Margaret's people. So Margaret's a type of Inavaluit that um, doesn't eat muskrat because they live higher up where the muskrats don't grow. So Margaret grew up eating caribou, um, sometimes musk ox, whale, fish. She did not eat furry little creatures. So how it would feel to most of you to eat this is how it felt to her. She really didn't like it. Here's another picture, Margaret. Uh, and there's uh, uh, the missionaries, just their uh, schooner, and they go up and down the Mackenzie River when the ice goes away and they pick up children along the river and on the, on the coast too. So Margaret lived far enough away. They couldn't just come and grab her and make her go to school. She asked to go to school, um, but this boat would go and it would gather the children. So after Margaret's uh, two years away, if you can imagine if you've ever felt really super homesick being gone for two years from your family, 
they finally told her, get on a boat, we're going to take you back to meet your parents. Her parents were coming to a community a bit closer in Tuktoyaktuk, and that's where she was going to meet them, but it's still going to be a long, long journey. Now, I'm going to back up and tell you a story so that, um, that happened before that, so Margaret can tell you a story of something that happened on that journey. So when Margaret, if you remember, I said she had to work in the hospital. So when she was working in the hospital, there was a time where she was just working around the clock and she had to go to the bathroom so bad. And every time she went to go, somebody would stop her and they'd be like, oh, you need to do this. You need to do that. So finally she got away. And I think we've all been there before, even the adults. We like we just can't get free and you have to go. So she finally got to where she was going to go to the bathroom. And one of the brothers, so that's the men that worked at the school. So they would be like the custodians and do the odd jobs. One of the brothers at the school decided he was going to play a trick on Margaret. So he got down in front of her and made the scary face and she had an accident. Probably us adults were going to have an accident if that happened. So her mean teacher made her wash her underwear and lay it out on the front lawn where everybody would see it. So they'd know she had an accident. So it was like a horrible thing. So she was really did not like this brother at all. So now they're on that boat traveling. He's on the boat. They're, they're taking a long time. It's going to take about a week to get her home to her family. And they stop. And Margaret, do you want to tell them what happened when um, you stopped and the cook told you guys to go do something? Uh, the cook, uh, they stopped and the cook said, if we uh, go find some duck eggs, well, she'll make pancakes for us. So Agnes and I ran and we figured, well, we go near the river, the creek there, there'll probably be a lot of eggs. In the meantime, we'll see this great big white thing. And uh, uh, believe it or not, it was that crazy, that crazy brother, he was having a... <laughs> well, anyway, he was going yes. to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> but it was showing and we found out who it was and we would just start laughing. And a bunch of other kids seen that, they wanted to know why we were laughing. And so they came and looked at him too. And oh my God, he never bothered anybody again after that. So I, I think that was maybe a little bit of karma that um, he had humiliated her and then she came across him and he was going to the bathroom. We tried to get this into a couple books, but it kept getting edited out. So if you listen to us today, you'll know the story, but you're not going to find it in any of the books. So Margaret finally got to go home. Margaret, um, do you want to read today from A Stranger at Home? Yes. Yeah, you will. Okay. Um, so this passage is actually really difficult for Margaret to read because her homecoming turned out a little different than she thought it would be. So the boat finally came to shore. She didn't even wait for it to stop. She just looked out and she saw her mom and she ran for her mom. And now I'm going to have her read to you from a stranger at home about what happened when she went home to her mom. What page is it on, Christy? Uh, let me just... Oh, let me oh just... I, I got it. I oh, found you have it. it. Okay. Yeah. I turned again to my mother. Our eyes were level. I was no longer the little girl who had always looked up at her. I was desperate to find a glint of recognition, but there was none. Her face was still scrunched in protest, disbelieving that I was her child. Not my girl, not my girl, she called again to the brothers. I looked again to the boat behind me where the brothers stood and I tense, ready to run if they made a move to come down and haul me away from my family. I was going to boat. I'd run to the end of the peninsula and jump in the ocean if I had to. I was not returning to the school with them. I was never going to let them take me back. It was their fault that my mother did not know me. It was because of the brothers, the priests, and the nuns that she could no longer see who I was. They had cast an outsider spell on me with their endless chores and poor meals. They had turned me from a plump, round-faced girl my mother knew into a skinny, gaunt creature. And they had cut my long black hair into a short, choppy bob. They had spent two years making all these changes. I was now 10 and several inches taller than I had been when my parents left me at the school up the river in Eklavik. 
I scanned the crowd for my father. He had to come and save me. One of the brothers stepped onto the gangplank and I leaned forward to run, but I was saved. My father emerged from the crowd and caught me in a tight embrace. The smoke smell of his parka wrapping around me, his strong hunter's hands stroked my hair. Uliman, he said to me, the special name I had not heard for two years. I whispered it to myself, Uliman. The Inuit name my grandfather had given me felt strange to my tongue. I could not remember the last time I had thought of the name, let alone heard it spoken lovingly in my ear. I no longer felt worthy of it. It was like a beautiful dress that far too big for me to wear. At the school, I was known only as Margaret. Margaret was like a tight, scratchy dress, too small, like my school uniform. Not wanting my father to see it, I was no longer his ulama. I buried my head against his chest. I felt a soft touch lighter than my father's on my back. A familiar warm touch that worked its way into my heart with a tenderness I had not known for a long, long time. Only one person had ever touched me so sweetly, my mother. She slid her hand from my back and around my chest, reaching for my buried face. Her fingers were smooth against my chin. I shrank from them, filled with shame of having all but forgotten how affectionate a touch could be and cried until my tears turned my father's bark wet. So a very sad homecoming. She just changed so much that her mom didn't recognize her. When Margaret got home, she then had to work really hard to relearn her language. She no longer spoke the same language as her mom. She forgot her language. Um, so she couldn't speak in of a looked in anymore. She only spoke English, but her mom didn't speak English and had to learn a whole bunch of jobs she missed out on. But her first year home, she got her own dog sled and team. And Margaret, do you speak the language now? Yes, I do. And this is one word I like using. I learned it from my grandmother. It's kanok itbit. It means, how are you? So Margaret is a traditional language keeper now. She loves her traditional foods and, and has a lot of traditional knowledge. She worked really hard on that. And here she is at 16. Maybe some of you can relate to this walking with a foot in both worlds. It's a little bit more modern outfit, but also a lot of traditional elements to it, like her kamik and all the beadwork and embroidery. And that took months and months to make. So that's showing her uh, being really proud of where she came from, no matter what happened at the school. So after we were done, um, fatty legs, we did a stranger at home, which Margaret read to you from, which is about her journey fitting back in. We did when I was eight, um, which has more pictures and less words, but it, ha it takes place at the same time as fatty legs, but has some different stories in it. And not my girl takes place at the same time as the stranger at home, with, but with different stories. So, and now we're at our 10th anniversary of fatty legs. So Margaret's the woman who did not want anybody to know her 65 year secret. And now we're four books later. There's a music video called Say Your Name with it, that she's featured in. That's by Keith Sokola. There's um, a musical production that's been staged several times. And as I said, we're at Fatty Lakes 10th anniversary edition. So even if you've seen uh, the regular Fatty Lakes, this one has all sorts of new elements in it um, and some updating of the language. So I'm gonna stop sharing so that we won't miss out on um, the questions. That that's amazing. And, and thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Christy. I'm, I'm so impressed with not only your story from your childhood, but how you have brought that forward in your life now and, and shared it with all of us. So thank you. Thank you very much. We have some really nice questions coming in. And I know you kids sitting in your classrooms, it's almost lunchtime. Uh, we're, we know, we know, <laughs> but we're going to get to a few questions first. Um, let me see where to start. This is a really interesting one here. Um, somebody wants to know, Margaret, did you have some close friends back in school? Did you make some connections with other kids in residential? Oh, yes. Me yeah, had one, especially her name was Agnes, and we grew up in the same village. So uh, we were friend, lifetime friends. Okay, very good. 
And Luca in grade six would like to know, why did you start writing these books? What inspired you to get them going? Uh, well, it's Chris, Christy. She was very interested in it after I mentioned about the stockings and she's, and her editor really was after her to write a book. Well, actually yeah. how, <laughs> how, it, how it happened. Um, so my, my, uh, I was raised by a stepfather who went to residential school. And so I, I seen how that could leave a lot of pain, uh, even when people are adults. And so I had always wanted to know more about residential school. And also I wanted my children to be very proud of being indigenous and being in Evaluit. And the best way I could do that was to show them their grandmother is their biggest hero and she is. So bringing those two together, when Margaret told me the story, I was like, here, this is, this is the answer to everything. And I had um, been reviewing books for Anik Press at that time. So um, the paper bag princess <laughs> and uh, Elizabeth reminded me a lot of, of Margaret. So I really wanted to, if I was ever going to write a children's book about Margaret with Anik Press and we got talking one day, I got the same phone call Robert Munch got. Um, there was um, Rick Wilkes on the phone with me asking if I would write Margaret's story. So very exciting. And um, so I was so excited. I said, okay, Margaret, like we, we're actually going to write this. And she was like, no. <laughs> I was like, what? She's like, this is just my answer to everything. And it would mean so much to the children. Uh, but she finally gave in. That's good. That's good for us that she did. Diana in grade six would like to know who inspires you? Uh, me? Yeah. Well, both of you, but yes. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm always reading because that's what I went to school for. I my sister quit reading books to me after uh, about three months. She said, go to school and learn how to read yourself. And I start asking my dad immediately if I can go to school because she wouldn't read anymore to me. Yeah, and I, I really want to learn how to read. <laughs> Yeah, for, for me, um, well, Margaret, obviously, <laughs> is a big one. And I think, um, oh, so many mentors and elders, uh, just to name a couple of my, um, my one um, elder from ceremonies, Deborah Grant, who was an Indian boarding school survivor, who's just gone on to help heal so many people. Um, my dear friend and mentor, uh, Keith Sokola, who uses art in really creative ways. He's a singer songwriter and brings a lot of healing to the people and, and gathering people what he calls modern day rituals. Um, yeah, I'm just in, in awe of uh, people out there doing healing work really passionately. Yeah. Silas, who is in grade five, would like to know, what did you do after school, Margaret? When school was finished. Uh well, I stayed home and helped my parents because I had a lot of brothers and sisters. And I want you to go to work. And dad said, no, you're not going anywhere until you're 18. So I said, oh, my goodness. Uh, anyway, I, and I helped look after my brothers and sisters and until I was 18. And I went to work in a hospital in a clavicle where I used to go help when I was little and that was and I also uh, I worked it for the Hudson Bay and uh, that was yeah different too <laughs> that flame of writing inside you the whole time no doubt and Mar Margaret met a, a cowboy up north who was working up north. And she, when she's not telling stories, she followed him south. We're still pretty north than most of you guys, but she followed him south and became a cowgirl. And she didn't even grow up ever seeing a horse. And she became a cowgirl. <laughs> so. That's a good story you're adding there, Christy. <laughs> um, I think we've got time for just one more question. And I'm sorry to say that because we have so many great questions from kids. But... Um, here we go. Why did the raven pick on Olamon so much? Did raven pick on everyone like that? And that's from Dominic in grade five. Well, she especially picked on me because maybe because I was not an easy child to you know, push around. I don't say anything. I just stare at her and 
I don't think she liked that too much. Uh, but anyway, I I tried, and uh, the more I tried, the more mean she got. <laughs> so I just thought, yeah, and I, until one day, one of the priests came, Agnes and I were talking in our language and we're not allowed to. And uh, this priest come along and he stopped and he was speaking our language and we thought, oh my God, we're really in trouble. <laughs> and he asked me, he said, uh, which one of the nuns was it that does that? And I wouldn't tell him. And then finally he said, well, he asked me again, and I told him it was a nun, and we call her Raven because we don't want to use her name. So after that, that was the second time I went to school. She never bothered me again, but, but it never dawned on me just the other day that that's what happened. When you think enough time, you remember things like that. Yeah. So. If, if the students out there had questions that we didn't get to, um, I'll just say again, you can send me, um, Margaret's my best friend, we're together all the time. You can send me a message on Facebook Messenger, Christy Jordan Fenton. We have a Facebook page, Fatty Legs. Um, you can email me, C, like the letter C, C Jordan Fenton at yahoo.ca. Um, or track us down any other way you can, and we will make sure that your students get those burning questions answered. And um, yeah, shout out to Lorene and to Jessica, a couple of teachers we really love who are joining us today, and anybody else that is out there that that uh, we've met across our trail. It's great to see you again, and great to make new friends too. Wonderful. We are so grateful to you both for joining us here today. And we wish you all the best with this promotion for the 10th anniversary of Fatty Legs. Thank you to our kids, our school groups. Well, for thank you very much. <laughs> it's be bye well. Bye. Stay healthy. Be well. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. Unless Christy has something to say. I'm still here. I'm just trying to find where my button is to log out. <laughs> so, uh, oh, here we go. It's down here. I can't get my cursor there. You can log out, Margaret. I'll, I'll give you a call in a little bit. Yeah, okay. All right, bye. Bye. Thanks for the help, Colleen. You bet. Bye. Bye.